Science fiction is an amazing genre, which never fails to inspire feelings of awe and wonder as we imagine the amazing possibilities of what the future may hold. According to movies, weekend trips to the moon and meetings with extraterrestrials should be a regular occurrence by now. But sadly, sci-fi has sold us a series of space-based dreams which will never become reality. At least, not in our lifetime. Or will they? Thanks to the combined efforts of government space agencies, private companies, and brilliant scientific minds, man has overcome its recent apathy towards space, and our lust for the cosmos now shows renewed signs of success. Right now, there are missions planned and in progress, which will shed light on some of the biggest mysteries of our solar system and beyond. So let's take a look at some of the biggest questions and find out when we might get an answer in our special Strange Mysteries investigation into the mysteries of space we might solve in our lifetime. Five. Who will be the first to Mars? Ever since man took one small step and landed on the moon, we've known our second step would be Mars. But it feels like our trip to the red planet is long overdue. George Bush said we'd be back to the moon by 2012, and that we'd have a Martian outpost in 2020. But he also said his favorite book was The Hungry Hungry Caterpillar, so we really should have known better than to trust him. The idea of visiting Mars has been oversold and overpromised to us on levels no man's sky could only dream of. So what's the deal? When are we going? What will we find? And who will have the honor of stepping foot on that rusty red soil and shouting first in the Martian comments section? NASA's current goal is to get a human mission to Mars by 2030 using the Orion spacecraft. Orion is currently early in its development phase and isn't expected to carry human passengers until 2023, at the earliest. But NASA insiders have claimed staff are being pushed to hit a 2021 goal. With this, followed by an asteroid capture mission and a Mars flyby in the years up to the manned surface landing. I'm not sure pushing NASA employees is a good idea, though. Push your staff at Starbucks and you might get a crappy coffee in a badly mopped bathroom stall. Push a bunch of rocket scientists and your mission could have an unpleasant explosive ending. But NASA's not the only one checking out the red planet and saying, What's up, girl? In March of this year, the Russians also tested an engine which may prove vital to their own Martian ambitions. And the likes of China, India, and Japan have publicly stated their desire to give it a shot, too. NASA's most likely rival, however, is the European Space Agency. But right now, Europe's having trouble sending citizens to Britain, let alone another planet. So don't get your hopes up, folks. What is looking increasingly likely is that a private company may beat all these government organizations to Mars by several years. Forget Mars One and their bullshit reality show mission. Those guys stand as much chance of reaching Mars as Danny DeVito reaching the top shelf. No, it's actually everyone's favorite South Park villain, Elon Musk, who seems our prime candidate to fund man's first steps to the red planet. In 2002, Musk founded the SpaceX Corporation with the long-term goal of reducing space transportation costs and enabling the colonization of Mars. In April 2016, SpaceX managed to land a reusable rocket on an ocean drone ship. And as of July this year, SpaceX rockets have supplied the International Space Station with cargo on nine occasions. Sadly, on September 1st, their Falcon 9 full-thrust launch vehicle exploded during a pre-launch test, proving a major setback for Musk's ambitions. And not only that, it also convinced me to take the bus instead of buying a Tesla car. Thankfully, this disaster hasn't affected an agreement between NASA and SpaceX to send a landing craft to Mars in 2018. The concept for this vehicle is called Red Dragon. And in June 2016, Musk confirmed it will be launched at some point in the next two years. In the meantime, SpaceX has also been hoovering up lucrative government contracts around the world, which means their plans to hit Mars won't be struck by funding cuts, unlike those of NASA and the ESA. In January 2015, SpaceX sold 8.33% of its company to Google and Fidelity for $1 billion, 
meaning the company is currently valued at around $12 billion. So if you combine the future sales of shares with money-spinning contracts and all those hidden PayPal fees that piss you off but you just deal with, the only thing that should stand in Musk's way is the ability to develop the technology. So how's that going? Pretty well, it seems. Musk says he's on course to enable regular deliveries of cargo to Mars by 2018, sending a rocket every two years in order to build a base by 2024, with his ultimate goal of sending a person penciled in for 2025. And despite the recent snafu with the exploding rocket shenanigans, progress towards Mars seems to be ahead of schedule, based on a recent announcement regarding the Mars Colonial Transporter. The MCT was the original name for SpaceX's Martian spaceflight system, but in September this was changed to Interplanetary Transport System. As Musk said, the system in development was capable of not only traveling to Mars, but far beyond it as well. That's a pretty ballsy move there, Musk. Let's hope this ambitious rebranding proves accurate. The company considered to be SpaceX's main competition is the Mars Base Camp Organization, which has an itinerary set out for several Mars-related missions taking place between 2020 and 2028. Mars Base Camp plans to use vehicles designed by Lockheed Martin to send astronauts into Mars orbit. Yeah, that's right. Lockheed Martin. Those guys who make weapons to blow up people in parts of the world you've never heard of. I mean, if the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are going to have a silver lining, getting to Mars is a pretty shiny one, I guess. But the mystery of who will be first to reach the Red Planet is mostly something for the history books, because more substantial are those missions whose purpose is to gain information. Information about what elements a planet is made of, what it'd be like to do star jumps there, and whether it's possible the planet can support life. And regarding life on Mars, this last question is something we may be very close to answering. 4. Is there life in our solar system? Mars has long been considered the most promising location for life in our solar system, but mostly for the same reasons you hope your house keys are in your back pocket after a night on the sauce. It's the closest place to look, and it's going to be dang hard to find if they're not there. Scientists have yet to uncover definitive proof that life has ever existed or currently exists on Mars. But that's certainly not for lack of trying. And there are a few clues that were close. The Mars rover Curiosity recently proved that the conditions for life were once present on Mars, when the planet was warmer and wetter than it is today. And the forthcoming ExoMars mission hopes to build on this. ExoMars is a joint mission by the European and Russian space agencies. Whereas previous missions have only detected the presence of methane, a gas which could have been produced by living organisms, the Trace Gas Orbiter on board the ExoMars hopes to map the sources of methane on Mars in order to help find out who or what is creating this gas, with the end result being the possible location of biosignatures, which indicate past or present Martian life. That'd be pretty awesome, right? Because let's face it, it's been a pretty sucky year so far. But if we do genuinely find spiders on Mars, we should probably keep an eye out for David Bowie while we're there. The 2016 stage of the ExoMars mission will be followed by a rover landing in 2020, which is the same year NASA plans a new life-detecting Mars rover of its own called Mars 2020. But perhaps the most eye-catching mission proposed by NASA in recent years is their plan to drop an unmanned submarine into a lake on Titan. Titan the largest of Saturn's moons. In fact, it's even larger than Mercury. But what makes it so interesting is not its size, but its giant hydrocarbon lakes. So far, this is the only place we know of in the solar system which can support liquid lakes. Lakes which are made up of ethane and methane. Yes, we've made the lake of farts joke before on here. Let's move on. Within these lakes, it is speculated that there may be small pockets of ammonia and water mixtures. So why is this important? Well, in 2014, researchers in the journal Science reported that tiny microbes had been found living in similar conditions when they observed the life forms existing in pockets of water within Trinidad's tar-filled pitch lake, meaning that life can indeed survive within a vast ocean of oily goop. And if it can survive here, 
That means there's a possibility microbes could have developed and continue to exist today within Titan's hydrocarbon lakes. NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts program is currently studying the feasibility and logistics of throwing a submarine at Titan and seeing what happens. But it could be as late as 2040 before we see the mission take place, due to the requirement for Earth to have a direct line of sight with Titan for communications. However, if NASA can be persuaded to build some sort of communications relay orbiter, and if the discovery of life elsewhere gets everyone's juices flowing, our submarine trip to Titan might take place a lot sooner. One mission whose future is more certain concerns NASA's ambition to explore Europa, the icy moon of Jupiter, which is scheduled to be visited by an orbiter sometime in the 2020s. Europa shows a lot of potential for life, as there is strong evidence of liquid ocean beneath its icy crust. And in 2015, Barack Obama ordered $15 million of funding be put aside for the Europa mission's development phase. Thanks, Obama. Hashtag Europa Lives Matter. NASA is in the process of selecting thermal imaging cameras, spectrometers, and ice-penetrating radar equipment for the Europa Clipper Orbiter, which may help us investigate the chemical makeup of Europa's underground oceans without having to drill a huge hole and send a submarine down. This is good news because the icy crust is as hard as granite and between 10 to 30 kilometers thick. Oh, and newsflash. Literally as this script was being written, NASA announced that astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope may have observed water vapor plumes erupting off the surface of Europa. See, I told you these discoveries could take place any day now. Although even we didn't think it'd be that soon. So clearly there are many possible locations where life might exist within our solar system and we might even find them in the next few months or years. But as scientifically important as microbes and bacteria are, what really gets the public foaming at the mouth hole is the possibility of something bigger. 3. Is Proxima Centauri B Habitable? In August 2016, the world collectively lost its when the European Southern Observatory announced the discovery of a potentially habitable planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the closest known star to the Sun, with this red dwarf low-mass star a measly 4.25 light-years away. And it is orbited by an exoplanet, the creatively named Proxima Centauri b. I would have called it Planet E. Mekharambi Hillary face, but I guess it's up to them. The exciting part of this discovery was that Proxima Centauri b resides in its star's habitable zone, which is what we call the area around a star where a planet could orbit and potentially support liquid water. Because Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, its habitable zone is much closer to the star than the one surrounding our sun. So, whereas Mercury's surface temperature hits 800 degrees Fahrenheit at an orbit of 0.39 astronomical units, Proxima Centauri b may enjoy Earth-like temperatures, despite getting up close and personal with its mummy star at a distance of 0.05 AU. But temperature alone does not determine how habitable a planet is. And there are many questions we need to answer about Proxima Centauri b in order to determine this. What is it made of? Which elements make up its atmosphere? Is it tidally locked with one side facing the sun at all times? And does liquid water genuinely exist on its surface? To solve these mysteries, we'll probably have to send a probe to the planet. But at 4.25 light years away, that's no easy task. The Juno probe, piloted by Ellen Page, which arrived at Jupiter, traveled at a maximum speed of 265,000 kilometers an hour and took five years to journey 2.8 billion kilometers. So even if a similar probe could travel at its top speed 100% of the time, which it can't, it would still take over 17,000 years to complete its mission, a time frame still relatively short by Half-Life 3 standards. So, it may seem that exploring Proxima Centauri b is merely a pipe dream, something that our generation will never ever see. Like hover cars, sex robots, or one more good season of The Simpsons. But don't write it off just yet, because according to Dr. Gillam and Glada of the Pale Red Dot team, for sure, to go there right now is science fiction. But people are thinking about it, and it's no longer just an academic exercise to imagine we could send a probe there one day. Okay, fine. It's all well and good that some people are thinking about a mission to Proxima Centauri, but that doesn't mean it's gonna happen. 
Right now, I'm thinking about lying on a bed with eight greased-up supermodels. Supermodels who love me for who I am, not for my money or soothing sensual voice. But just because I'm thinking about it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Maybe not, but you might be less skeptical than I am when you find out that the people thinking about a Proxima Centauri mission are Professor Stephen Hawking, physicist and billionaire Yuri Milner, former NASA research director Pete Warden, and Mark Zuckerberg. Great! If the folks of Proxima Centauri B want to find out how racist your high school friends are, we're all sorted. The project these esteemed fellows are working on is called Breakthrough Starshot, and it aims to develop a fleet of thousands of tiny light sail spacecraft, which can travel between 15 to 20 percent light speed. These craft would be powered by light propulsion from Earth-based lasers, and the plan is to use the technology to travel to Alpha Centauri over 20 to 30 years, with data from the expedition taking four years to return to Earth. But after the discovery of Proxima Centauri B, they're also considering a flyby of the planet on the way. Because it'd be kind of dumb to miss out when you're traveling all that way. It'd be like going to SeaWorld to look at the tortured, agonized orcas and ignoring all the depressed porpoises the next tank over. The cost estimates for this mission are between 5 and 10 billion dollars. And if the necessary technological improvements can be achieved, the first crafts are slated to launch in 20 years. Meaning you guys will be in your 70s before we see results. And I'll be a half-man, half-cyborg in a voiceover guy retirement home. So what can we get excited about in the meantime? Is there anything else in the universe we can take a peep at? 2. What else is out there? Proxima Centauri B was discovered using an instrument known as HARPS, which is a spectrograph attached to a 3.6-meter telescope in Chile. This instrument detects planets by looking for the effects of an orbiting body on its parent star, but such a telescope is incapable of taking a direct image of a planet so far away. However, with the 30-meter telescope currently under construction in Hawaii and the giant Magellan and European Extremely Large Telescope both being built in Chile, an actual photograph of a distant exoplanet may be possible once they are completed in the early 2020s. If you dig space photography as much as I do, prospect of seeing faraway distant worlds probably means you'll need to pause the video and go change your underpants. But if you can't wait until 2020 because you're impatient or dying, we've also got the launch of the James Webb Telescope to look forward to in 2018. This telescope, which is the size of a tennis court, should give us a better view of exoplanets and other objects including the mysterious KIC 8462852 which is much bigger than a tennis court, also known as Tabby's Star. Scientists have been baffled by its odd light fluctuations, with some believing it could be evidence of a giant alien megastructure called a Dyson Swarm, which could only be built by an advanced two Kardashev civilization. This is nothing like a type two Kardashian civilization, which would just be a load of fat ass frauds with big lips and diabetes. The James Webb Telescope has been constructed in collaboration between 17 different countries and is intended to replace the aging Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble was launched in 1990, and in its 26 years of operation, it's helped us to understand the age of the universe, the rate at which it's expanding, confirm the existence of supermassive black holes, take images of planets outside of our solar system, and give us some astonishingly detailed shots of the planets in our own backyard too. So, imagine what we might find using the larger and altogether fancier James Webb Telescope. Two narcs in particular have already slapped down their reservation for the James Webb, as Laura Creedberg and Abraham Loeb of the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics want to use it to confirm whether the aforementioned Proxima Centauri b could harbor life. Instead of using tiny space boats powered by lasers and Mark Zuckerberg's cash to travel to a planet 20 years from now, these scientists want to use the James Webb to interrogate Proxima Centauri b within the next few years. They describe the telescope as having the ability to put the first constraints on the possibility of life around the nearest star to the solar system. And simulations run by the pair have demonstrated that the James Webb will help us distinguish dead, gray space rocks from potentially life-harboring planets both quicker and easier than ever before. 
But of course, before you can analyze a planet's composition to determine its habitability, first you have to find the dang thing. And that's exactly what the Kepler Space Observatory has been doing since 2009. In its seven years of operation, Kepler has helped discover 4,696 potential exoplanets, of which 2,330 have been confirmed, and the rest, uh, I don't know, a booger on the lens, I suppose? 21 of these confirmed planets were deemed to be less than twice the size of Earth, with many of them far better candidates for habitability than Proxima Centauri b. In January 2015, the number of confirmed Kepler planets exceeded 1,000 for the first time. But in May 2016, NASA announced the discovery of another 1,284 exoplanets. Clearly, our ability to identify new worlds is reaching Sherlock levels of intuition. However, Kepler's ability to continue finding planets depends on how long it remains functional. In 2013, the craft was crippled by a reaction wheel failure, and this was after one wheel had already broken down. As Kepler needs three operational wheels to keep it steady, its ability to capture new data was thrown into serious doubt. But despite a spacecraft emergency in April 2016, NASA was able to restore its ability to make observations, and they are confident they'll be able to squeeze this last mission out of Kepler even after its fuel runs out, announcing a three-year extension in June 2016. Furthermore, in 2018, NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite will attempt to use the same methods used by Kepler to find even more distant worlds among the stars. For the past four years, Kepler has monitored 150,000 stars in a single area of the sky. But the test mission will home in on 200,000 bright nearby stars. So we may enjoy another massive spurt of planets all over our star chart sometime soon. <laughs> Can't wait. The TESS effectively acts as a spotter with the James Webb Telescope taking the crucial sniper shot and filling in the details. And when you combine this with the efforts of the European Next Generation Transit Survey, the Sophie Eshell Spectrograph, the soon-to-be-built Every Scope and the work of citizen scientists via the Zooniverse project, which you should definitely sign up for, by the way. It's clear that our knowledge of worlds beyond our solar system is going to get bigger and even more interesting over the coming years. And there'll be a tabloid article about the discovery of a second Earth roughly every two weeks. But that's a small price to pay if we get just one answer to the questions we have about the universe. 1. The Dark Matter Mystery Scientists believe that the universe is made up of 68% dark energy, 27% dark matter, and only 5% actual matter. So, when we use our super fancy telescopes to peer out into the universe at planets, stars, and gas clouds many light years away, we're only getting a tiny glimpse of that 5% of matter. We know barely anything about the remaining 95% of the universe. But soon, thanks to several ongoing and planned missions, we may start to understand more about these mysterious theoretical components, and in turn, we'll know more about how the universe formed, the rate it is expanding, and how it might look in the future. Investigations into dark matter have so far confirmed what it is not, rather than what it is. We know dark matter doesn't come in the form of stars or planets. We know it doesn't exist as dark clouds of baryonic matter. And nor does it exist in the form of giant galaxy-sized black holes. Which is good news for everyone. But so far that's not enough to come to any concrete conclusions. It's like when you smell what mum is cooking for dinner and the aroma is kinda meaty. You know it's not broccoli. You know it's not ice cream. And you're pretty sure it's not unicorn stew because unicorns have never been directly observed outside of our beautiful dreams. This is also why we don't know what dark matter is comprised of, because it has never been directly observed. This elusive substance doesn't emit or interact with light or other forms of electromagnetic radiation, but we believe it exists as we've seen its gravitational effects on forms of visible matter. In order to find out more, NASA launched the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope in 2008 in a joint mission with the U.S. Department of Energy and agencies from France, Sweden, Germany, Italy, and Japan. And Fermi has made some amazing discoveries so far. 
including pulsar-emitting radiation within a supernova 4,600 light-years away, new information about where gamma-ray background radiation comes from, and in 2008, it observed the largest energy release yet measured by man, with an explosion in the constellation Carina, containing the power of 9,000 supernova, firing out material at 99.9999% the speed of light. If you want to put the size of that explosion into perspective, it's about 1 16th of the total explosive power you'd get if you accidentally clipped a car in Fallout 4. Fermi's mission has been extended for two years in an attempt to focus on finding dark matter, and it's being helped by NASA's Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is a particle detector on board the International Space Station. But at the same time as all these space-based shenanigans, we're also fixated on the scent of the mysterious dark energy. In 1998, observations by the Hubble Space Telescope reversed a decade of scientific thought when it discovered that the universe was expanding faster today than it has in the past. Whereas we previously believed that the attractive force of gravity should be pulling objects together and slowing things down, we have no explanation for why it's doing the exact opposite. But just because we can't explain it doesn't mean we can't give this non-existent solution a super cool name, such as Dark Energy. Dark Energy is like an emo kid who just discovered Edgar Allan Poe and Albert Camus. It's barely understood at all. It's almost like it doesn't want to let us in to find out more. So far, our theories range from Dark Energy being a simple property of space, comprising of temporary virtual particles, or that it's some kind of dynamical energy fluid or field. And in order to eliminate or prove these theories, NASA will use the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, which is an observatory whose main mission is to help us understand more about dark energy. This telescope is the same size as Hubble, but with 100 times its field of view. In fact, its field of view is so wide, it could even fit your mama's sweet anaconda buns in there. Is that where all the dark energy is hiding? Also known as W-First, the mission was confirmed in February 2016 and has a six-year plan in place when it launches from Cape Canaveral sometime in the mid-2020s. And in addition to its investigations of dark energy, W-First will also be used to identify new galaxies and planets. But more importantly, it will also perform tasks aimed at measuring the curvature of space-time and the consistency of Einstein's theory of general relativity, because one of the other theories regarding dark energy states that Einstein's theory of gravity may be incorrect and that we'll need a whole new one to account for how dark energy behaves. So, over the next decade, we may be able to observe parts of our universe we've never seen before. And this could change everything. Understanding dark energy and dark matter has the potential to shatter our existing preconceptions about the universe and science majors. That means a whole new hundred dollar textbook for everyone. <laughs> Yippee! So that's our piece on the mysteries of space we may see solved in our lifetime. Did you like it this long? Would you love it if it were longer? We're like the sting of YouTube content providers. Either way, tell us what your thoughts are in the comments below. And don't forget to check out some of our other videos on space, Mars, and deformed people.